what is the most famous study ever done in psychology, not just social psychology, in psychology? Milgram's obedience studies come out first every single time. If you ask social psychologists to say something to justify our existence, uh, something we've done which has surprised someone or, or done something useful, again and again we will mention Milgram and how important Milgram is, because Milgram and his work isn't just known in social psychology, isn't just known in psychology, isn't just known in other disciplines, in history, in politics, even in theology. It's the sort of thing that is known in society as a whole, that has contributed to a cultural shift in our understanding of the ability of humans to act with inhumanity. And I'm going to challenge our received understanding of Milgram try and persuade you that almost, almost everything we think we know about Milgram is wrong. But this is a quotation from a wonderful book um, looking at the way in which the Holocaust has been represented over time uh, by Peter Novick. He says, from the 60s on, a kind of synergy developed between the symbol of Arendt uh, Eichmann and the symbol of Milgram's subjects invoked in discussing everything from the Vietnam War to the tobacco industry and, of course, reflecting back on discussion of the Holocaust. It's a taken for granted. It's self-evident. We all know that it is true. These separate strands, the psychology and the history, weave together to create an explanatory rope that is far stronger than either one alone. And if you have doubts within any one area, you think, well, perhaps we've got problems. But, of course, it's been proven in the other. Psychologists who have doubts say, but it explains the history, and historians who have doubts say, but the psychology explains it. A remarkably powerful explanatory complex. And what I'm going to try and do is unravel those threads. So let me start off with it. And again, he finds exactly the same thing. Each time you're given an order, you stop. And we've also done a replication. Uh, and again, you give the order and people say, what do you mean I've got no choice? Of course I've got a choice. I'm going to stop. That's what they do. That's what they say. The one thing, if you take nothing else from this talk, the one thing you should take is Milgram's research is emphatically not showing that people have a tendency to obey orders. If anything, they show the opposite. Now, any experimentalist will say, of course, there's a confound in this. There's an order effect. The fourth prod is the last one, and by the time of the last one, uh, nobody would go on anyway. They've had enough. And so I'll simply say that we have replicated this in a between subjects design, using different prods in different conditions. And again, you find the order is the least effective thing to do. So there is a challenge as to how to do something which has, if you like, the impact and the control of Milgram, but does not violate the ethics. Now, the first thing you could do is to revisit his own studies. And one very simple thing that we did, I say we, I'm always speaking about myself and Alex and Megan, was to say to people, here are Milgram's descriptions of the various conditions. Tell us how much you think you would identify with the experimenter, how much you think you would identify with the victim, and let's then correlate those, uh, and including the differential identification, with obedience. And if you look, the black line is obedience, and you will see a very close line between identification with the experimenter and obedience. It's a correlation of about 0.78. It's a negative correlation with identification with the victim. So, for instance, if we take a variant like when uh, Milgram did the study, not in Yale, prestigious real science, but some dowdy commercial premises in downtown Bridgeport, in a sense, what they produce is the inability to step outside yourself and be reflexive about your own position. And here, I just want to make a point about Arendt. Thus far, I've talked about Arendt and Milgram as the same thing. Actually, I think that's unfair on both of them. I think the encounter between them, which many people think is the glory of both, is actually the tragedy of both. Because it leads Milgram to simplify his account, thinking, oh, well, this will have real impact. But it leads to a misunderstanding of what Arendt was really saying. Thoughtlessness has a very different meaning, if you like, from a cognitive or a philosophical point of view. For Milgram, 
thoughtlessness was unawareness. For Arendt, thoughtlessness is the lack of a reflexive stance, the lack of thinking about what you're thinking from the position of another.